Well, it's good to be back with you after a few weeks off, and uh, we're hosting again our Wednesday devotionals beginning today. Uh, this Sunday, August 16th, I will begin a series entitled Realm of Truth. It piggybacks on where I left off before leaving on a little bit of a break uh, when we covered Realm of Grace. Truth is an absolute, as an absolute, I should say, has been rejected in postmodern thinking. In fact, we live in a time which has been declared by sociologists and theologians as post-Christian. Um, I probably don't have to define this last term because it means exactly what you think it does. But just for the sake of clarity, uh, post-Christianity is the loss of the primacy of the Christian worldview in public affairs, especially in the Western world where Christianity had previously flourished in favor of alternative worldviews such as secularism, nationalism, environmentalism, and militant atheism amongst many other ideologies. Uh, to confirm such a declaration, Gallup Poland has found that only 42% of high school graduates believe the Bible is the Word of God. Only 38% of all people in our nation believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and only 11% of postgraduates believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And at first glance, this is depressing, and it should be because Christians have allowed this to happen. Uh, it should also be alarming because it means we're losing. Losing in our nation, not in the world at large, because there are spots around the world in which Christianity is flourishing. So we are losing on our own turf. Now, to illustrate in part one of the many influences which dissuade people away from considering Jesus as the absolute truth and Christianity as the hope for mankind, I turn to a segment of uh, Dr. Bodhi Bacham's book entitled The Ever-Loving Truth. Here he tells of his experience in college with one of his religion professors. He writes, anyone wishing to understand uh, the cause of the rapid spread of this post-Christian mindset must examine our colleges and universities. One of my first religion professors made this concept very clear to me. I had just written my first paper in my Old Testament class, and he called me into his office to discuss some of the content. He told me that I was not being academic enough. I relied too much on the Bible, he said. Later in the semester, he called me in after a statement I had made on a test that alluded to Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment and manifestation of one of the principles which we were covering. This time, he was not as patient with me. The conversation occurred over 13 years ago, but I will never forget it. He said, you are not here to be an evangelist. He went on to say that perhaps I was not suited for religious studies. A later uh, Bottom uh, went on to postgraduate studies at the University of Oxford. And he stated that part of his motivation to receive his PhD and to study at Oxford was to prove the professor wrong. As he writes of the professor, he spoke for the culture at large. He represents the informed intellectuals and academics in our culture. He was not a voice crying in the wilderness. He was one of the cornerstones of an academic program at one of America's top universities. His answers to religious questions would be considered learned and progressive to many people. One can find attitudes similar to his at many of our nation's top secular schools and even at Christian universities and seminaries. I have found him to be quite correct on that matter. Now, you have heard me speak of the need to adapt to culture over the past six years. I never felt I needed to define this statement or explain it, but considering some issues that have come to the forefront recently, I believe I need to. By adapting to the culture, I have met societal changes in regards to music style, the language people communicate with, uh, to you know, communicating with one another and, and methods by which people receive and disseminate information. This is what missionaries do in the mission field in order to reach people groups with the gospel. But by no means did I ever mean the denial of the truth of God. Adapting to the culture was method oriented, not mission oriented. Now, why is this important? Well, we are in exile today. 
we're in exile in our own land. I believe we are in exile in other ways, but I do not feel that it is appropriate for me to speak of such at this time. Being in exile doesn't mean we are finished. It means that we are fighting a different battle. We no longer have the advantage, the high ground, the majority of agreement with us. It means that we are in the minority with little advantages, if any, humanly speaking. We must use the greatest resource we have, our Lord, our King, our God, Christ Jesus, His power given through the Holy Spirit of God. When considering such, uh, we do have an advantage. Many months ago, on Wednesday night, I began to walk through the entire book of Daniel with a small group that's, that gathers for the Bible study. Uh, we are going to spend some time in Daniel in another way, a message way, a devotional way. Uh, Daniel was exiled, and there are many similarities to Daniel's day and our own. Uh, you could say that Daniel lived in a post-Jehovah day. Uh, I believe we can gain encouragement from Daniel. We can learn from Daniel's actions, faith, and dependence upon God. And I believe this is one of several letters or books in the Bible which can speak truth directly into our culture and situation today. So let's jump into chapter 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of the Babylonians and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Now to understand God, we have to understand where the kingdom of Judah was in relationship to God at this time. Uh, the kingdom of Judah was not in a good place, and it wasn't God's fault. In fact, in 2 Kings 23, 37, it is recorded that Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now, God's discipline or wrath is an interesting thing. We often think of it as lightning bolts and rumbling of thunder, but often it is God permitting sin to take its course. In Romans 1.21, for example, Paul writes, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. In other words, God let sin run its course. So God permitted Nebuchadnezzar, to take siege over Jerusalem and then defeat Jehoiakim and the city of Jerusalem and take national and religious articles from the temple and place them in the treasury of Nebuchadnezzar's God, which was most likely Marduk. This symbolized Nebuchadnezzar's supremacy over Judah and Judah's God in his own eyes. Now, the second humiliating event which occurred while uh, was exiling the leadership of Judah. Uh, then the king ordered Aspenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, good-looking young, young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, are soon to serve in the royal palace. Uh, train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. Uh, they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. This is significant. Now notice verse 4 and 5. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. Then the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So what exactly is happening here? It is a reorientation. It's a tearing down of their cultural values and morals, their religious belief system, and replacing it with the Babylonian worldview. It's the same method that totalitarian communist governments do to people who stray too far from the party line. It's a re-education camp. Now, from a political standpoint, this is genius. Remove the leadership, and you remove the possibility of uprising. Retrain the leadership of those you've conquered. You make them then into Babylonians, and you establish your worldview upon them. This was the test that Daniel had to endure. He had to hold on to the values that he was taught and raised with, taken from God's law. 
he had to hold on to the morals that he was raised with according to God's ethic. He had to hold on to his belief in God regardless of whether it appeared to Daniel and his friends that God had abandoned Judah or was conquered by the Babylonian gods, which they didn't believe. Daniel knew in his heart that God was greater than Marduk, so he kept the values and the morals and belief in God. And the very, the very same morals and beliefs and, 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 and values that he was raised on and raised in. His worldview by faith didn't change. Now, we will come back to verse 5 in a moment, moment. But look further into the passage because it illuminates the degree by which the Babylonians took the reorientation of their Hebrew exiles. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. And the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. Their Hebrew names were rejected and they were given Babylonian names. Every vestige of their Hebrew heritage was being replaced by Babylonian culture and a Babylonian worldview. By these new names, they had had their identity taken from them and were given a new identity. Now, I don't know how you would feel, but I would feel pretty lost. Think about the sorrow, the sense of loss of belonging. First, your nation drifts from God, which is heart-wrenching enough. We've seen that in our own lives, haven't we? Now it is now no longer in existence. Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? You have been taken captive and relocated, living in a foreign land where they want to re-educate you, strip you of religious and national values, your moral standards, and your faith. It feels very similar to the battles we fight, right? They even deny your birth name, replacing it with a name they have chosen. Now, it's true that the Babylonians treated the Hebrew captives well. They are offered food from the king's table. They were being well educated and were in the process of being prepared to serve the king. They were most, they were most likely treated better than most of the folks under Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom who were Babylonians by birth. However, there are things in life which are more important than status and wealth and worldly security. Knowing who you are and to whom you belong is one of them. This is why I said I would feel lost, and I'm certain to some capacity they did too. This brings us back to verse 5. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. This becomes the test, the point at which Daniel feels compelled to take a stand. Verse 8 begins, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, we don't know why the foods were unacceptable. Uh, some scholars surmise that it was dedicated or sacrificed to Babylonian gods. Yet Daniel doesn't reject vegetables from the king's kitchen. Others suggest that Babylonians ate food which was forbidden for Hebrews to consume, such as pork and other meat or protein products that were, uh, that were prohibited uh, in the law of God. Others suggest that it had to do with aligning themselves with those they left behind in Judah, who no doubt were barely getting by on whatever rations they could pull together after the conquest of Babylon. Whatever the reason, Daniel and his friends were not open to the food from the king's table. And one of the things that we do know is that throughout this rough period in Israel's history, there were two practices from their religious belief system they tried to keep intact regardless of the consequences that they faced. One is circumcision, which was the sign of the covenant with God, and two were dietary practices. So dietary practices were exceedingly important to their identification with God, regardless of their circumstances and regardless of who uh, ruled over them. So such becomes an issue in the early church as well with the Gentile question, the eating of food and the question of circumcision. So it continued on even after the birth of the church. Now let's go a little further in the text. Now God had given the chief of staff, both respect and affection for Daniel. 
notice that the writer attributes the chief of staff's respect and affection for Daniel to God. Now continuing. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your, your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. So Daniel's request puts the chief of staff in a pretty tough place. So a compromise is struck. It's one of faith for Daniel. Daniel says, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. Daniel said, at the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. So for 10 days, Daniel and his Hebrew friends trust that God will provide their strength in the midst of being conquered, displaced, reoriented, reeducated, renamed, stripped of their heritage. These fellows do not give in. They hold to their values, to their morals, to their faith in God. And then the scripture reads, at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed instead of the food and wine provided for the others. Then we read of God's blessing. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. Now why is this important? Because God will use these men time and again, not only with Nebuchadnezzar, but the following kings who come after Nebuchadnezzar. Following the Babylonians were the Persians and the Medes. We live in a postmodern world where truth is opinion and facts, data, traditions, historical narratives are rejected. Our nation is a post-Christian nation. We haven't been conquered from the outside, nor have we been whisked away as an exile. Yet we live in an age and a time where we find we have a different worldview from the majority who live among us. We live in a nation where political powers reject what we hold to be truth, where Christian morality and ethics are replaced by secular standards that continually change, and where belief is in man-made systems of power. We are in exile in our own land. We are the minority when we believe in absolute truth, which is Jesus. When we hold to values based in Christ, when we follow a morality taught to us by Jesus and demonstrated in the narrative of the epistles. Yet even within some of our own institutions, there is a reorientation, a reeducation, a new identity given that, those, that, that does not resemble anything that we read in the Bible or have experienced in our lives. It's easy to feel lost, even while being at home. Daniel and his friends came to the point where they stepped out on faith and they stood their ground and God used them. And maybe it's time we too step out in faith and stand our ground, allowing God to use us. He is the same God, after all, the same one who kept Daniel 